Welcome and good morning. How are you, sister? Very excited to have you on again and chit chat. It's been a while. I know we've both been really, really busy in the garden. It is officially spring in my book. Um, I know it's not officially on the calendar. Um, so we've had some questions come up from the last episode. People wanted to know a few things. So I really want to cover that. But I also want to first ask you, what are you doing right now in the garden? Like you're in Idaho. You're tell us, tell me your zone again. And what have you, where are you at? Shoot. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I'm in zone 7A. And right now in the garden, I'm adding some more seedlings into the ground. So I actually, I did that three weeks ago and I'm adding more. I do succession planting now where I put my radishes in the, in the soil. I put my spinach, my lettuce, and I do it every two to three weeks so that I have succession and different things coming up at different times in the greenhouse you might call it <laughs> in the garage, mm -hmm. um, garage I have I went ahead and planted some more cabbages and like Brussels sprouts artichokes things like that so in addition to what we had talked about last time the tomatoes and peppers that's what we have going on right now so that what about awesome. you me well I have been kind of a slacker in the garden outside but I do have a bunch of plants in my bathroom greenhouse uh, situation my plant nursery which I will have a video coming out about that um, just showing my setup um, just sharing like what you and I use because you also inspired me with the lights and you could pretty much stick that shelf anywhere which is great yeah. um, but I'm Very so functional. yes so I got a I'm going to, I'm going to have a test garden going this year that I'm going to be teaching people um, how to plant within a small space. I'm going to be using one of, one of my 12 by four by four foot garden beds. And basically I got a, a package of seeds to test out from this one company. Um, I'll mention that separately, but um, they're organic non-GMO heirloom seeds. And I got 30 packets, like a survival gardening kit. And I'm going to do the square foot gardening to just teach people companion planting. And I'm going to try to plant every single thing in this one garden bed because I did the square footage. I have 44 something. I have over 30 feet. I have only 30. So for some of the bigger plants, I can allocate something. And then I'm going to use a trellises for certain climbing things squashes and watermelons. You know, they get to spill out of the garden bed naturally. So I'm going to position things in such a way that it's going to be a fun little experiment. So oh, my plan so, so my plan is this weekend I am starting all of those seeds separately, like not all of them, some stuff I'll have to wait. Um and I'm going to prepare that garden bed, make a sign, and then I am starting my tomatoes and peppers much later than you are. Um but I did this last year. I started after you. And I researched that you can run lights 24 hours and double the growing time when the plants are really small and it does not impact them at all. Now, you do not want to do that when they're bigger. Like you, um, you know, make sure you have your fans. You want to establish the root system. Do not do this without fans because <laughs> then they'll be like wiggly little fellers. Mm -hmm. So anyway, as soon as I, uh, I'm going to start the seeds, get them in my pots. I'll get all my pots ready this weekend. And um, then I'm just going to double up on the time. So that'll be a separate video about the light, <laughs> the growing thing. And then my garlic is looking beautiful. I don't have any radishes yet. So I, I'm being very like, oh, optimistic that I can get my radishes in and some of those things and some of the root vegetables um, because we have not been able to. It's been way too nasty outside and too yeah. cold. And it's tricky. Like we always get like our fourth and fifth winter Mm -hmm. in March, April, yeah. and May. And, and April's a pretty rainy month here. I, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I would imagine it's the same in Oregon, if not more rainier. It, it is. And we've had, uh, last year, we had an April snow. And I'll never forget the cherry blossoms with snow-covered ground. And it was just like so weird. But, you know, anything that I am planting, I am using the the winter gardening method of hoops. Mm -hmm. Basically, we get crazy hailstorms in April and in May, all the way through the end of May. And these hailstorms yeah. will decimate plants. So anything that is going to be planted in my garden, besides like strawberries and berry bushes and stuff, is going to be with hoops. Um, and I, oh, I'm just using like not necessarily greenhouse fabric every time, but that other stuff like the, the bug, 
Um, like the frost fabric, essentially. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. I'm using like frost fabric because um, I have bawled my eyes out having mm -hmm. to run outside and watch like huge hails. And I had beautiful plants coming up. I mean, it just shredded shredded everything I remember shredded that. even shredded the celery like because you yeah. think a stick it was like <laughs> yeah it just slices that. them up it's crazy yeah so long answer but that's kind of where I'm at um anything interesting that you've learned that you want to share I know you have been taking pruning classes any fun facts about pruning yeah so I just released a couple pruning videos that I'm going to create into a guide which you um, introduced me to that. So I'm working on my guide little by little. And once it's all done, then I'll post it. But um, I think one of the most interesting things I learned is that I never really thought I knew this, but I didn't ever think about it, but that pruning is a dwarfing process. And so oh. your trees can be as small as you let them be. You know, there are trees that are marketed as dwarf trees and it is easier to manage those, but essentially it comes down to you as a gardener, as a, as a, you know, tree keeper. <laughs> If you might want to call it that <laughs> mm -hmm. um, as far as, you know, what size you want to keep your tree. So I think that um, that really helped. I don't know. It gave me some more confidence in my pruning. Like, okay, I'm going to make my orchard for me. Like this is going to be the height of my trees because this is what works for me. And I'm pretty short. So <laughs> we're going to be doing a lot of pruning. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I think the other things that I learned was, um, you know, back in the day, we used to put black tar anywhere we made our big major cuts. And so one of the takeaways was don't do that because you're actually trapping bacteria, you're trapping moisture. And, and you know, you don't want to cut just flush to the tree because that just creates a portal for germ bacteria to enter. And so there were just a lot of stuff that I've always been taught. And, you know, as we've learned things along the way, we've realized that's not the best way. And that brings me to my, you know, one of my biggest big aha things in gardening is there's a lot of things that people tell us to do and not to do it. Now we should listen and, and, you know, learn from others. Cause that's kind of the point you learn from other people's mistakes. So you don't have to make your own, but still ask questions and, and check everything, you know, is that correct? Is that the best way? And, and it comes down to your own environment, your own um, zone, like there's a lot of stuff out there and we have been so blessed with access to all of that with the internet, but you, you do want to make sure that you also do your due diligence and read, you know, and, know. and trial, try, try things. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, in the last episode, we talked about winter gardening, people telling you that you couldn't grow a garden in the winter and you can't plant till this thing happens. Um, you know, so I've recently done this where, um, so I was making a video about sprouts, you know, growing sprouts, because that is one thing that every person can do, even if you are in an apartment. And I know you're a big fan of sprouts and their nutritional content, especially like broccoli and stuff. And yeah. It, the 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 common instructions are you have to do it put it in a jar or if or a tray and put it in a dark place i have never put it in a dark place i just stick it out by my window and they grow just as fine and i they i don't know they'll help germination they germinate within hours <laughs> i think we just so complicate things way more than we is. have to sometimes and i think it yeah it does it holds people back um and that's why you, you gather information and then you do things that fit your lifestyle and mm -hmm. it's Test. better to do it than not do it at all. And if you fail, just try again and do it different. It's, it's yeah. not a big deal. And and the thing is, the things we know is based on the things we've tried. If we, as, a, as human beings, have never tried something, that doesn't mean it's not going to work. We just don't know if it will work or not. So when yeah. you try things, expect things to fail quite often when you do something that isn't like standard, but also expect to find some unexpected surprises. Like, yeah. um, yeah, I, I've been, you know, I've learned a lot for sure. Um, one of my mistakes I made last year, and this is a, a trial. So not last year, but a couple of years ago is, so I got in the habit of burying my, um, you know, lasagna mulching and all that kind of stuff. It works amazing for building your soil. Like I have amazing soil now, but I've learned that I need to bury it under the ground and have the right ratio of carbon to to uh, nitrogen, so green stuff and brown stuff. 
And then it like disappears within a month because I have so many worms in the bed. But the mistake I made is I at one point would just like scatter it on top and then throw some straw over it and then throw some other straw and kind of compost in place during the off season. Mm -hmm. It works amazing. It breaks down, but it does allow, it makes it easier for surface bugs to live there. And so when it's time to grow things, you end up with a slug problem. Then what your soil is, amazing your plants are just like monstrous like jack and the beanstalk but the, the the slugs love it and so every year i am like hunting down slugs with a headlamp and beer things and traps and using sluggo around the garden beds so they can't like sneak up into it mm -hmm. or to pull them out because i want the slugs to leave wow. um so I've learned, which is a tip, if you don't want to put sluggo, which is technically OMRI approved, but it does contain a lot of iron in it. If you don't want to be adding that to your garden bed, um, put it around your garden bed on the edges. The slugs will like leave and go snack on that stuff and die yeah. um, or put it in little trays you know, like little mm -hmm. actual traps. There's all kinds of ways. And that's another, just reiterating the whole point that some mm -hmm. things might work for somebody and not for someone else. In our area, like in this, at least this area here in the Valley, we have very uh, alkaline soil and also very low in iron. And in fact, a lot of areas, we have lots of farming and um, irrigation. And so with the water, a lot of the iron is trapped. Mm. And and so sluggo works great here because our iron yeah, is low uh, or it's exactly. trapped. But for yeah. someone, you know, living in a different area of the valley or in another state, that may be an issue. So yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I think about that. Yeah, you have to think about that. And then, you know, maybe a little bit of sluggo would be fine. But then I don't know what else they put in there. So like, I'm very suspicious of like, oh, yeah, how this is going to impact the Micro microbiome biome of the soil for sure. um and so you know i'm still going to use i still i i'm still battling the slug problem i am doing things differently now so it's better and better every year um you know i'm burying things i'm i'm composting differently like i'm still doing it in the garden beds but i'm just being a little bit uh, strategic about it and then when it comes to um the sluggo like just having little uh like old lids and just sprinkling some in there and just placing it yeah. and they just come to it's like putting beer in there it makes That's great the traps way. yeah for people that but for some people it might be fine i just the soil is a living thing. I have a lot more respect mm -hmm. for my dirt now. I'm like, the more natural things you use, the, yeah. the better. It, it just always is that way. Um, I, I didn't want to ask. Oh, oh <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. I wanted to ask you if you don't mind sharing how you put together your garden boxes, you know, the, the layers. And I think that's a question I've had come up multiple times is what goes into your garden boxes? How do you decide, you know, ratios and things like that? As far as, um, like the gar, like how we built the garden beds, or what goes no, into the soil. Just what goes into the soil. Um, so it it was a think of it as a journey. It's like a health journey, and food is medicine. So that same concept of food is medicine for the soil. And so when you get, um, when we first started out, we started with a three-way mix because we needed a way to fill our garden beds. And uh, we got a three-way mix, you know, from a, a local place that had, you know, people got stuff from and they liked it. But it's kind of sterile if there's no worms in there, right? Um, and so when we started, what we did is different than what we do now. We needed different things. So we filled the bottom with branches and uh, bigger log pieces and then smaller pieces. So mimicking the concept of hugel, hugel culture a little bit. And just to, because we didn't need all that volume on the bottom. And I have- What did you call it? Hugel? Hugel culture or whatever. It's it's where you bury branches and logs and then put dirt over them and then plant into it. Um, so we put that at the very, very bottom. So it wouldn't eat up all the nitrogen, you know, like, and I have two foot tall beds, so that's a lot of space to fill. And I have 10 or 12 of these 12 by four garden beds. So that's a lot of dirt and we needed a dump truck load. So branches, three way mix. And then I went, got uh, manure. And so I got like composted uh, ma ma manure, which you want to be really careful with. So it's not containing any, uh, herbicides. Mm -hmm. If the hay had herbicides, it could leach, it could show up 
in the compost and manure. So, so make sure you're buying organic compost. Organic or do a simple test. Ask, you find someone, ask them if you can just take a, a little bit back to see, you know, and, and you know, it, sometimes it's an awkward conversation, but do, if you do a little test, plant some um, like pea, pea seeds in there um, because they're sensitive to certain things or, you know, plant, just plant some different kinds of seeds to see how they react to it. Like tomatoes are sensitive to some things and not to others. And so it might not impact your greens, but it might impact your tomatoes. Anyway, so manure, three-way mix. And at that point, I had to add a lot more stuff to it. Like every year I had to make sure I had enough, um, you know, uh, you know, I had like these powder organic mixes. So I would add stuff like blood meal, this, you know, uh, mag you know, more magnesium, more that. And now I don't even do that. I don't add blood meal. I don't add any of that because my soil has it all. So what I'm putting in my soil is totally different. Right now I am, and then I had a, a, a you know, I needed more worms. So I started, bear, you know, burying the stuff and then layering it. I learned burying is better than layering. But now I just add to it a little bit and I add organic matter in the wintertime on the top to kind of like, uh, be a covering for the soil so the weeds don't grow so leaves and stuff and then my rabbit poops and I hardly and like maybe some magnesium and that's pretty much it <laughs> that's amazing yeah and that's that's exactly it is is your what you start out with is not going to be what you're going to end up doing after you work your yeah. soil for some time and if somebody tells you you're going to watch videos and say, oh, put this in your soil, put that in your soil. Well, it depends if they're doing or I've, I've seen videos where people like don't add fertilizers in this. Your soil should be just the way it is, blah, blah, blah. Like, I'm like, well, if you're buying sterile soil, this is not going to work for people that are starting with the three way mix that has no worms in it. And um, there's one gal that I follow that I love her videos, but that I remember seeing one of the advice videos and I was like, Yes, but you've been gardening in your soil for a long time and you've built it up. Yeah. And so that advice will work for me and that will work for you and that will work for that person, but not somebody who just bought bags of soil from the grocery or from the exactly. you know, Home Depot. So, it, and that actually is another, um, you know, important piece to your garden boxes. All of our garden soil really is the mycorrhiza. Mm -hmm. And in, so, mycorrhiza is the symbiotic relationship between fungi and our plants and <clears throat> so it refers to the role of the fungus um let me actually pull up that i can never explain it correctly that's okay yeah it's it, the root so the root system of your plants and its symbiotic relationship with the fungus and it takes years to create this root system and fungus symbiotic relationship Mm -hmm. And so when you're starting out, you can add mycorrhiza to your soil to mm -hmm. help help that system. Um, I lost my train of thought, <laughs> but mycorrhiza. <laughs> Basically, it's almost like you're infecting your soil with yeah. this mycorrhiza, like you're, you're speeding up the process. And that's true. Like you, I don't need to do that. And I don't need to do that nope. anymore. But in the beginning, I needed to add stuff that had mycorrhiza in it. Um, and I had to like, a good example is for our seed starting mix that I used your recipe. Um, I used cocoa core. I bought um, worm case casings or castings. I don't know how to say it right. And then, um, you know, the worm vermiculite. Yeah. Anyway, I put worm casings in there and I would put them in other probably potted type of situations. What I put in my potting soil is not what I'm going to put in my garden bed because I have so many worms in there. It's kind of cool. Um, they're like everywhere, especially, um, so I have this tradition now. I let one garden bed rest every year. I pick a new garden bed and I just work through them. And that garden bed, I compost, I put all my chicken manure in there, which is really hot and I let it literally rest and I cover it with something. So nothing grows there, but everything just breaks down. I mean, and when, if I open it right now, it looks like a worm bin. And so I'm like, why would I add? worm casings when I have a ton of stuff in there. Um, but yeah, the, and oh, an, an, an interesting thing with mycorrhiza is, um, so when, if you, uh, if you, uh, plant peas and beans, they actually have a unique relationship with how they create nitrogen. And mm -hmm. you know that it, 
so for anybody watching, if you have peas growing in your garden, pull up one of the roots or when you're transplanting them, if you start them somewhere and look on the roots, they're like these little nodules and, and they basically take nitrogen and make it usable. That's the simplest way of explaining it. And it has to do with the little bacteria and fungi or whatever, the living organisms. The beneficial living on the microorganisms. Root. Yes. Yes. The happy things. And I just think it's so cool that, you know, it, it does that. And actually, if you want a really cool cover crop, do a uh, field peas. Um, you plant them around now. You can order them. And they look so beautiful. They bloom. The bees love them. And then what you do is you just like hack them down and just flatten them. And then you they kind of dry up in the sun in the month of May. And then you plant your tomatoes and peppers. like. And that's a very strategic way to create a fungal mm -hmm. network to support your yes. other plants that you're going to be planting in that same space. And so that's also part of the, and this is kind of a controversial topic, but yeah. no dig, you know, no digging mm -hmm. uh, gardening approach has to do with the fact that every time you dig, you're actually, um, you're breaking up that, you're damaging that mycorrhizal fungal network. And exactly. So you spend all this time building it up and then you go in there and you till it and you dig it and you're just starting over. Chopping again. it up. Chopping exactly. It up, chopping it all up. So the cover crops are fabulous for creating yeah. that network under the and soil. And this is, this is what I mean by I don't fertilize very much anymore. To. I have my rabbit droppings that I throw in. I have the hay and whatever. And then I do utilize the cover crop. So for your heavy feeders, like tomatoes and peppers, that's, I did that in my pepper bed. I had amazing peppers last, last year. And even now when I go and I scoop up the soil, it's like the texture of worm casings. There's so much, mm -hmm. uh, wormy activity in there. Um, and then the cover crop helps so much because it, it brings that organic matter on top and it serves as a mulch until it breaks down. And then it gives you time, you know, to add some more straw or leaves you have or a whatever. Fabulous worm farm situation going on. I there. love it. I remember you, I used to have a worm bin. Do you do that anymore? No, we, we are in the same boat where the garden beds are just full of worms now where I'm like, I don't really need to baby a worm bin anymore because I, I had to put hay mm. around it to keep the worms from freezing and I was like I want things to be as natural as I possibly can yeah. now it was important for me to do that then when I did not have that much worms in my garden beds but again what you start with is not what you end up with and we don't need exactly. to do that anymore and that advice and I've learned that and it's I'm almost like that if if you're a new gardener like this is the one takeaway make sure that when you're seeking out advice the advice is for beginners starting to build something from scratch. And it specifically addresses yes. the fact that this advice is different. You will not need to do this later. Um, I'm trying to think of what else is something that we were always told we had to do, but we realized we don't have to do anymore. Do you catch yourself using as much uh, neem oil anymore or sprays for things? What do you, no, how do you feel about not that? Not since I started beekeeping. Um, since I started beekeeping and planting for pollinators, I've gone away from using neem oil um, unless it's on my, uh, there's certain times of the year where I feel comfortable using it on my fruit trees. Mm -hmm. And that would be now. Um, but mm -hmm. once the pollin pollinators are out there and they're getting themselves um interacting with the neem oil, it can kill them. So I've, I've gone away from using it. Um, and ladybugs too. Ladybugs like, too. Yeah. 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 So uh, same thing. I used to, well, I didn't have a, I didn't have a lot of flowers. I didn't have a lot of other things growing. Um, I didn't plant as much. Now I try to stick as many different things. Um, I love the Cosmo seeds, by the way, you gave me last year. Yeah, they were the most, they They're grew dainty in and beautiful. But these bushes, Nadia, were this big. <laughs> yes. I don't know what I did wrong. I didn't realize they would get that big. I, I It was amazing. Anyway, and the pollinators loved it. So started doing more of that. And I realized that neem oil can come in handy in certain situations. Like on maybe. your chickens, if they have, say, yeah. mites, you know, use it on their legs. For house plants. House, house plants. plants. If you get an infestation. But now I'm just like, okay, if I use this, it could actually disrupt your, it, because it, it's an antifungal and anti, it could actually mess with your soil. Yeah. So you don't want that sterilizing your soil. It's almost yeah. like, you know, too much, you know, there's like washing your hands too much can dry out your skin. 
Exactly. You know, over, Everything in moderation over, and in the right time and place. In the right time and not in other situations. And the idea is that if you maintain your garden and keep an eye on things, maybe do some manual things, have a lot of variety, yeah. I will get bugs. But sometimes I'm like, you know, there's not that many. They're keeping themselves. In I have a lot of those bugs, but I have a lot of And those bugs. bugs are feeding the other beneficial bugs. So it's yes. like this symbiotic harmony. Yeah. And that's a good point that you just mentioned. You said variety. I think that is huge. When you have variety, there's a lot of options for the bugs, the bad bugs to pick from. And sometimes they'll gravitate towards one and you'll go, oh my gosh, my squash didn't do good at all this year because it got eaten up by this bug. But actually it was a blessing because it kept it away from this one. And sometimes they, they gravitate towards one type of squash more than the yeah. others. Like planting blue Hubbard squash in your squash patch is fabulous as a sacrificial oh. plant. Because they love, like the um, the squash borers, they love blue hubbards. So plant blue hubbards in your patch to, yeah, to attract them. Yeah. Using sacrificial plants is, is a really great natural way to to garden organically. So plant blue hubbard blue squash hubbard as squash. your sacrificial squash. What else can be a sacrificial crop? Kale. Kale. <laughs> <laughs> I, my <laughs> Seriously, I I don't even I don't even try anymore. You know what I do? Kale sprouts. So I grow the kale. It becomes a sacrificial plant, and then I cut it when the seeds are on, and you know, harvest the seeds, let them lay out so the bugs leave, and yeah. then I have seeds. <laughs> That's exactly what happened with my winter garden. I have this one kale plant in there that is like a aphid resort. And I didn't pull, I was almost going to pull it. And then I'm like, no, because I have all these other plants I don't want them to go on to. And they've just stuck to that one. So it's been a blessing to have that. Thank you, Kale. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kale. Yeah. Yeah. Kale. I'm trying to think of what I had. Um, yeah. You know, I get stuff on dill. My, they like my dill. Yeah. And the little so, white flies or the yeah. aphids. They're, they're kind of a tiny little bug and, and it, it was right next to my sacrificial kale technically if I think about it. But um, yeah, I, and I love dill. So what I'm going to just start doing, I had good dill, my dill try in my strawberry ash. patch. Oh, ash. I'll have to Sprinkle try that. Ash. I mean, it does change the soil as long as you're mm -hmm. okay with it. Um, the ash was ash. fabulous. Another fact. So certain things that are good for something can change your soil, but it could be a good thing. And I actually will, ash would be good for my soil. So you can be strategic um, and plant other things that do better with ash, like potatoes. Yeah. They do great with ash. It's a good idea. I don't know if dill and potatoes are companion plants though, but yeah. anyways, food for I ash. had, so uh, uh, that brings me to plant variety and plant in different places yeah. because I have had dill in my strawberry patch do amazing that it just grew by itself. And then I had dill in my dill a area that just got devoured. And then any dill that just sprouted by itself in between like the rosemary and the thyme, that one was fine. It wasn't touched. I think it was the smells and it just mm -hmm. got hidden. The bugs couldn't find it. Yes. Of companion planting, like even that I have tested, um, like not I know some things supposedly work well together, but I have planted some things, maybe it depends on how close they are. Mm -hmm. That might, you know, too close might not be good because they impact, you know, the what they need for nutrients. But like, mm -hmm. you know, that definitely might have something to, to do with it. I, I'm having a, a, a brain fart. I've had such bad brain fart, farts. <laughs> I mean, brain <laughs> fog. <laughs> brain fog. <laughs> Is it just because uh, the change in the time, how has that impacted your... No. Well, I got sick. Rhythm. You know, I work in peds and so I get sick mm -hmm. all the time, but like for very short spurts, I get sick yeah. and then I'm better the next day. But every single time I'm like, gosh, my brain just gets foggier. So I need to eat more broccoli sprouts. <laughs> oh, really? I did not know broccoli sprouts helped the brain. It, helps your, it, it contains sulforaphane, which Correct. is important for your transulfuration pathways mm -hmm. for detox. So eating broccoli sprouts. Wow. I have been craving broccoli and we talked about various detox, you know, I'm going through some dental things and x-rays and this and that. Um, and I've just been craving them and they are just so good. I like threw them on a bite of pizza, like fresh sprouts on anything. And 
Fun fact for anybody watching, I could be wrong, but like two cups of sprouts or one cup of sprouts is the same as 50 cups of broccoli as far as the nutritional yes. content. Like, and they're so easy to make. And also, correct me if I'm wrong, it doesn't say if you uh, bl blanch them or if you freeze them, it increases the sulfur. The, the sulfurophane. The, yeah. Like, I'll have to but I do know, I mean, there's supplement companies out there that are encapsulating broccoli sprouts for people that can't make them or they're expensive. They are expensive to buy. So you could buy them, but if you can grow them, that's always, oh, more natural yeah. is always the best. All you need is a mason jar and a lid. And if you can get one of those little screen things, great, but you know, you can do it with You can even lid. get one of those, you know, trays. Po well, you can just take, grow. yeah, you can put it in a tray, put it in a casserole dish if, if you needed to and yeah. throw some, you know, whatever. But no, it really is um, so easy. And like, I feel that like anybody can do it. Uh, per pound, I think salad greens are one of the most expensive vegetables or not the most, but one of those up there mm -hmm. because A, they're lightweight. We pay a lot to get them. And then when we get them, we usually don't eat them all and then they go bad. And yeah. so- and that's up. another economical way to feed your chickens is to sprout their feed and a little goes a long way and there's much less waste. I need to actually start doing that or fermenting it again. I used to ferment all the time. I've been I using find... those bootstrap trays to oh, uh, really? sprout my chicken food and then take it, just take the tray right to them. And it just so, it's so fast and so easy. Like oh, within fast. three days you have sprouted greens oh. and, and you just take the trays and then move them back and forth. I I might need to start. I might need to start doing that. So I've debated, I've been kind of watching. I have a, I do have grass in my chicken area. So I'm like, well, maybe they'll figure it out, but there's just so much more nutrition in the sprouts if they eat that versus giving them the chicken scratch. And then they're not well, being they all, picky. They, a lot of it they don't like. They're very, they get picky about yeah, you know, the kernel size and whatever. So if you give them a sprouted kernel, they're they're going to mm -hmm. eat it. Yeah, you know uh, what we've been doing lately to increase our egg production. Random fun fact: I found some frost bitten uh, like beef in the freezer. I would not yeah. do this with pork or chicken, but and frost bitten fish that I mom and dad have been actually loading me up with their frost bitten food, and I got buried at the back of the freezer for the chickens, and I finally started giving it to them and they're they've been eating it up like crazy and my I swear they're bird, like t-rexes they really they truly are little t-rexes they are i watched a chicken carry a, a tr drag a t-bone to try to drag a partially defrosted t-bone steak the trick is in the, in the summertime it's really hard to do this but you don't want to because they have bugs but in the winter time if you give them a frozen piece of meat it stays so cold that as it melts they chip away at it and then it doesn't go rancid it's yeah. gone while it's just it's still got you know it's still cold when they're finishing it up did you end up giving your chickens any of your carcasses from the deer that you guys mm -hmm. harvested yeah we gave them um we gave them the, also the parts, like when John was cutting up the meat, he was cleaning off the, oh, whatever that stuff is gone. It's like this, uh, the stuff that doesn't taste good. You, you have to like cut off certain parts of it. It's like this uh, clear, I'm having a brain freeze. You guys know what I'm talking about. It's like a, uh, um, like a is, membrane. Is it like the, the membrane that you have to peel yes. off? It's yeah. like a membrane, but you have to remove that, the silver skin and stuff. The you have to remove skin. that stuff because it does not taste good. And so all of the bad trimmings and stuff and the bones with pieces on it, we froze them and then we would toss them out and they just go crazy for it. And then they have a uh, high protein poops, but. <laughs> <laughs> they go crazy so, though. They love the they red. Do. Yeah. And my birds are old. Almost all of them are over five years old. And they're laying so many okay. eggs right now, even for their age. Um, I do have 20 new ones coming, which will be an interesting adventure. I'm With so all excited. that meat, they're like, eh, five is the new two. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I know. Yeah, their feathers are beautiful. They're so fluffy. Oh, yeah. I just love this time of year. Like my, I, know. I feel like a different person. Like I just feel... <sighs> <sighs> yeah. Amazing. I know the it literally forward is my favorite. It was like it happened like this. The it first did. week I, I am dragging because I get up at 4 30. Uh so 3 30 to 4 30 adjustment is a little rough. Yeah. But once once I get adjusted to when I fall asleep, I, I, 
like, like right now. That Sunday when we, we moved our clocks forward, I, that was the day I went on my baking frenzy. I was like, oh, this is so exciting. Look at all, look, there's daylight <laughs> at 630. Like I can go for hours now, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So one of my favorite things is to have like coffee in the morning on my front patio on a little bench that we have out, out there. And now I can actually do that. I can throw on a jacket and I can sit there because I can actually see the sun coming up. Otherwise it would be dark so for like for ever. Your internal clock, your little pineal gland. Uh, yeah. You set your clock correctly so it knows day from night. So good. I think everyone should go outside for at least 10 minutes before 9, maybe 10 a.m. Just, just for that reason. Just for that reason, a hundred percent, and it just just sit there for a minute and think, and you know, be grateful, and you know, set your mind on the correct things before you start your day, and it just kind of sets you up for success. I mean, if you, um, it's so easy, and I'm so guilty of it to look at my email first thing in the morning, but I've been trying not to as much as possible, and I do it like afterwards. Yeah. But. So one of the questions that we got, and I don't want to forget this, was people wanted to know when to plant things so they could have a winter garden, so they can do succession planting. Like, um, I'm going to share a little tool that I use um, really quickly first, but it's called the Clyde's uh, Garden Planner or something like that. It's like $9 on Amazon. It used to be 7 It's the cheapest little thing you'll get. And that allows you to have a chart. Um, but it's it's not intuitive for the winter garden. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So the winter garden, um, so there's a couple winter gardens. There's the winter garden that you grow in the winter time, and that's your winter garden. That's the things that you're going to eat in that moment. And then you have your overwintering garden where you're actually planting things that you want to overwinter to harvest in the springtime or like late winter. Uh, did I explain that correctly? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, you did. <laughs> um, and so I think on my last video, I, I didn't make that clear. Like there is a, a winter garden that I grow in my garden in the months of October, November, December, January, February. And then I also plant things that I'm not harvesting during that time frame, but I am going to harvest when they bloom um, in February or March. So just to kind of preface that. Mm -hmm. So what I do in the summertime is in June, for example, and July, and I say June and July because I do succession planting. So I plant something and then I plant it again in three weeks as well. So in June, I'll start to plant my beets. And in July, I'll plant beets again. I do the same thing with carrots. That's my fall garden. That's for things that I'm going to be harvesting when the weather's cooler, but it's not winter time. So September, October, maybe November. Okay, so we'll there's that. Mm -hmm. And then in September, maybe early October, I start planting things like garlic. The garlic is for spring harvest. So it overwinters. Okay. Also in that time, I start putting my seeds into the soil for things that I want to bloom in the spring. So for example, I will plant cabbage, broccoli, um, radishes, turnips, carrots, and then they're going to very, very slowly grow, very, very slowly. They're not going to be ready for me to do anything with till like late February or March or even April. Wow. Sometime. So you plant them. I in... put the seeds in the ground. And wow. And then very slowly they start to grow. And then when the weather warms up, they, they bloom and I harvest them in the spring. Also in September and October, let me backtrack a little bit. June and July is a very busy month. Mm -hmm. In June and July, I also start seedlings, things like uh, cabbage, broccoli, uh, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, uh, some of my Asian greens, spinach, kale, lots of cool weather crops. I start in June and July to create transplants. And then those transplants I put into my garden in September and October. That's to have my winter garden. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's what I'm going to eat in the months of November, December, January, maybe February. I hope that's clear. So you're doing yeah. a little bit of both. You're doing some overwintering for mm -hmm. harvesting in the spring. 
And then you're also planting things that you can eat during the winter time. In September and October, I'm also putting radishes. And the cool thing about radishes is they are a fabulous food to eat in the wintertime. If you plant it in September and October, you're going to have radishes that are ready to eat in December and January. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then, and it's great because you can eat the greens. So you can add them to your soups, your salads, and then you're also getting to eat the actual radish itself. And they are the best tasting radishes. I kid you not. They're the best in the wintertime. They're sweeter in the so wintertime sweet. because, and there's no bug pressure. There's no bug pressure. On and then any of those greens either. And then you'll notice that, you know, in February, the radishes that maybe you planted in September, October, that for whatever reason didn't take off till January, February, those start to taste a little bit funky. Um, those I go ahead and pluck and take to the chickens. And that's when I start seeding more radishes. It becomes this like cycle. Succession mm. planting is literally, I think of it like my sourdough. <laughs> It's like you get into a rhythm. You're feeding yeah. things. You're like doing, and it, you do it in such a way that it works symbiotically. And in the beginning, it's hard because you really have to think about it and you have to time things a certain way. But then you start just routine. You're like, yeah. okay, boom, 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 boom. So I hope that's clear. Yeah, and also doing su succession planting f kind of follows the the concept of like some things you plant after other things because it prepares the soil or it adds something to it, you know, you, exactly. um, you know, like crop rotating. So that supports that concept. And if you don't think of it as a, this is the garden time, but the garden time is all year round and you're just planting things at different things. Like seeds are smart. They're God designed them in such a way where they know they just, they just know when it's time to grow. And if, if, you know, that's how we get volunteers, when you have a plant that goes to seed and, and bolts, if even if it is a radish or a carrot, I've had volunteer carrots come up, which is kind of exciting. I'm like, I did not plant you, but thank you for coming. <laughs> and they were in the ground and then they grew when it was time. And so I think that's, you know, those are cool. the only uninvited guests that I love <laughs> in the garden is volunteer <laughs> carrots. Oh, last kind of question. And then, you know, to kind of wrap this up, I struggle growing carrots, actually. So since we're on the topic of carrots, yes. that's why um, the seeds are so small, it's really hard to seed them. <clears throat> I have looked at carrot tape, but I don't want to put anything with chemicals. So I was going to try making my own kind of carrot tape with like cornstarch and, you know, maybe get some organic paper towels or something and create strips and then put it on there. But what are your suggestions for planting carrots? Like what Again, are your... I think carrots are just one of those things that we've overcomplicated. Mm -hmm. If you want perfect, thick, deep, you know, fat carrots, sure, you need to space them apart. And that's where it gets tricky because the seeds are so small. Um, and they're also very, very vulnerable because when you plant your carrot seeds, you're supposed to put them pretty much on the top of the soil. And then they're vulnerable because... You know, if there's too much sun, they're going to burn. If you have birds, they're going to eat the seeds. So for me personally, the best thing was to not fuss about spacing and be okay with some small carrots because guess what? You're going to have some small ones and you're going to have some big ones as mm -hmm. long as you plant a lot. <laughs> yeah. You're going to get a little bit of both. Um, so I sprinkle them on top of my soil and then I, I throw on some uh, vermiculite on top and uh, you might have to find something else because vermiculite is there's, there's been a shortage of it. I don't know if that's changed now, but there was a month ago. Mm -hmm. So I put my vermiculite on top or just take some really fine soil and just dust it over the carrots. I water it really good, like really good. And then I take a piece of plywood and I put mm -hmm. that on top. And I'm not going to have to water those carrots again because I've got my plywood over it. You don't need sunshine to germinate your carrot seeds, but you do need to protect them. And you also want to retain the moisture so that they can germinate. And then mm -hmm. in a week or two, you peek under there and they do take a while to germinate and you see those little green seedlings emerge. You can take your plywood off um, at that point and you may have to put some protection over them if you've got bird bird problems. Are birds ever a problem? Yes, they are. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Except um, for hummingbirds. Hummingbirds are like the perfect bird. Hummingbirds are the perfect bird, yeah. So that's how I do my carrots. I don't fuss okay. over spacing. I pl plant extra. That is one of the ones I do plant extra of because you're going to get small ones, big ones, but 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And since, and since I have rabbits, technically I could use that opportunity to, if I do choose to thin my carrots, they love the baby rabbit greens. They love the little carrot. So they'll get a nice ratio of greens to sweetness because the yeah. greens are better for them than the actual carrot itself. The That's carrot the itself best is the best way to thin them is just throw them in there and then yeah. pluck out the extras and take them to your animals if you yeah. have them. I'm going to do that. I'm going to try that. I'm going to try that this year because I love carrots. I think they're so tasty. Um, and so maybe I will do that this weekend because I think I can do it now. Now's yeah. a good time. Yeah. And a, a good fluffy rich soil is the best so that mm -hmm. they don't have funny shapes. Um, mm -hmm. And so then the, the nice thing is the carrots will be done before you have to go plant. So you could plant something else in that garden bed afterwards if all you do right now is carrots. Yeah. So I'll probably do that. Well, I am so grateful for your wisdom and advice. And I learned several things. Um, first Likewise. of all, thank you. Um, I'm going to link Nadia's links down below. Follow her as Pearls and Shoots on Instagram. And she's also a fancy smarty pants. So I will link her medical page. If you are a mom and have young little kiddos, or you just want to learn about, you know, functional medicine and health, it, it is advice that is applicable to adults as well. And I'm very excited for the time we got to spend and I'm excited for the next episode. I can't wait for the garden tours. We're going to have, yeah. yeah, we're going to have to do a, um, yeah, I, I I want to feature your garden tour one of these days. Like we're gonna have to figure. I'll have to come see you, and I'll have, have to, to come plan. see you, and then I will tour your garden. And we should do that. We should tour each other's gardens. <gasps> Let's okay. <laughs> this is the trip. So okay. Excited. So excited. All right. Well, I love you. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Love you too. Bye. Bye.